All right, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Matthew Brown. I'm the director of the Center for Values in Medicine, Science, and Technology. Um, and I want to thank you for, uh, for coming here tonight. I want to thank the co-sponsors of this lecture, the Center for Children and Families. Um, uh, and uh, uh, we, we've, um, we've been exploring the power of creativity and imagination with, with you all year. Um, this lecture series has uh, explored the evolution of creativity and imagination, their role in, uh, in psychology, um, in ethics, the, synth the creative synthesis of poetry and physics, um, uh, and uh, have really, I think, demonstrated already the important place of imagination and creativity in our lives um, and, and our culture. And tonight's lecture is going to continue this, uh, this, this conversation. To introduce our speaker tonight, I'd like to welcome my, my colleague and friend, Associate Director of the Center for Values in Medicine, Science, and Technology. Now, <laughs> okay. Hello, everybody. It's nice to see you here, and welcome to uh, last, the last of uh, uh, the talk in our series. Um, so Matt mentioned what I do here and how I am affiliated with the Center for Values. What he hasn't said is that I am a cognitive psychologist by training. And um, what a cognitive psychologists typically expect when they go to um, conferences, and in my case, this is the area of creativity, they typically expect talks based on evidence, quantitative evidence, um, reflected in a bunch of numbers and correlations and p-values and what have you, uh, descriptions of clever experiments and different ways to make people do creative stuff in laboratories. Uh, what cognitive psychologists don't expect, at least in my area, is to, uh, is to hear a talk in which a theoretical framework and synthet synthetical theoretical framework is given that actually um, uh, allows for much inspiration in different types of research, not just quantitative research, by qualitative research. And I heard such talk three years ago at the American Psychological Association Convention, and Vlad was given that talk. And uh, to me, that talk had a profound uh, effect and impact not only on how I started looking at creativity, so not just from the individualistic perspective, what's going on in creator's mind, but I started looking at the creativity from a larger perspective, uh, from the social cultural perspective. Um, apart from that framework that Vlad discussed during the conference, and you will hear about that framework tonight, Vlad has also tirelessly uh, and with lots of courage promoted qualitative approach to studying creativity, creative process, and imagination. And imagine again hearing that um, during the uh, uh, talks devoted to numbers and p-values and size effects and sample sizes and all that stuff. That was quite a revelation. So let me finish the introduction with that. Um, Vlad is an uh, uh, associate professor and head of the Department of Psychology at Webster University in Geneva, Switzerland. He's also affiliated with the University of Bergen in Norway and with uh, the uh, Paris Descartes University in France and also in another university, the Neue Chatel University in Switzerland. He has published more than 100 articles devoted to culture, creativity, and related issues. And he also um, committed quite a few books, and some of them will be on sale tonight. And Vlad, if you wish, would be signing those books for you. And um, um, Vlad, uh, this year, is also uh, a recipient of a very prestigious Berlin Award. And that award is given in recognition of outstanding research uh, by early career scholars in the area of psychology, of creativity, aesthetics, and the arts. And this award is uh, uh, given by the American Psychological Association. So I'm not going to talk anymore. You came here to hear Vlad and not me. So ladies and gentlemen, Vlad Glavine. <laughs> 
up to this wonderful presentation and uh, hello everyone thank you so much for having me here I was mentioning to a few of my colleagues that it's it's 3 a.m. in Switzerland so I'm gonna <laughs> kind of you know put on to that if, if I ever you know stop making sense at some point but I'm very happy to be here I'm gonna talk to you about um, topics that that I've been working on for a number of years now and uh, this is a great opportunity for me to put together some early work I've done on, on the topic of culture with uh, later work and kind of the most recent place um, where I'm at now in terms of thinking about creativity and imagination. So the plan of the talk is very ambitious for, for less than one hour. Um, I want to, uh, to discuss the association, the way in which we, we look at the relation between creativity and culture, to introduce the, the notion of imagination and how it fits into this, uh, this framework, um, then discuss the, the latest kind of model or where my thinking is at at the moment in terms of creativity, which is, I call it provisionally the perspectival model, and then look at three uh, concrete kind of application areas of, of this broader um, model. So looking at early development, at everyday life, and at society. And finally, finish with some reflections on, on ethics. And I found that little image there in the corner, and I feel it represents so well the way creativity, culture, and imagination will go about kind of being slightly circular, hopefully not too circularly related within the, the talk. So if we think about creativity and culture as two notions, and if we adopt a more kind of logical perspective on them, what possible connections can they have? Maybe there are more options than these, but broadly, I would think that you can either think of these two categories as quite separate from each other, you can look at areas of overlap between them, or, and this might be quite a peculiar way of thinking about them, you can look at them in a very integrated way, such that creativity and culture become almost one, and they're, they're really interdependent. I think you can already guess that my own thinking is going towards that end of this continuum. But I think it's also very important to, um, to understand how each one of these positions um, conceives of both creativity and culture. I will propose to you, and, and I hope you agree, but I'd be very happy in the end to have questions and disagreements as well on this, that the way in which we define both concepts necessarily implies the other concept in some ways. So, Creativity is often seen as, as a driver of culture. Culture can be seen as a resource for creativity. They can also be portrayed as, as kind of fighting each other a little bit in the sense that culture can be seen as something quite uniform and creativity is that element of difference. But whatever, however we conceive of them, I, I would say that you necessarily have to relate these two phenomena. So let's see how they've been related. I was talking initially about verses and and as, as, as type of, of connection. So if we are to adopt a creativity versus culture type of argument, then the first thing, of course, if you remember the two separate bubbles, is that, um, to notice is that creativity and culture seem to be external to each other in some ways. So there is a place where creativity happens. Magda was mentioning more individualistic approaches to creativity. Usually this is seen as the mind somehow. Uh, and then there is a place where culture happens, and uh, this is seen often as in between people or somewhere a bit external to the, the individual, a place of institutions and values and so on uh, that come to impact. I mean, the, being external doesn't mean that there is no connection, but still they're, quite, they, they're kept quite separate from each other. So in this, in this paradigm or way of looking at things, creativity is very much an individual, unique type of attribute, and culture is in a way the contrary of that. This is why I put the versus connection. Culture is what is shared, what is, what is common. So in many ways culture requires imitation, reproduction, and even conformity. I mean there, there is uh, work done in creativity obviously about how creators have often to fight or challenge culture. This would be the, the main relationship between the two because they need to fight the conformity that defines a kind of a cultural environment. So how does creativity emerge or look like uh, if we look uh, or if we conceive of creativity versus culture. Well, creativity is very much portrayed by this lone creator myth. I, I will call it a myth outright. The idea of the maverick, the idea that people can create a bit independently, alone. There is a, an element of disconnection there between the creator and his or her 
environment. In previous work, I referred to this as the he paradigm, and I mentioned he nods in a sexist way, but actually to, uh, this is a paradigm of the genius, historically, to, uh, to kind of point to the ideological construction of the notion of genius that tends to privilege and historically has privileged male creativity. So uh, the heights of creativity and, and the way in which it transforms culture, it challenges common culture, often lead to a, an image of exclusivity. Creativity is not for the many, for the masses. It's actually for very few people. It's a very exclusive type of attribute. And to quite an elitist understanding of what it means to create. So if you think about genius, and that's why I've used the he paradigm, so he, a third person, this other person, there are very few individuals who aspire and enter this, this realm of creativity. So this is one way of, of thinking about it. I, I also have some images. So here you have Rodin's thinker. Uh, it's not Rodin's fault. I'm not saying that he, he kind of embraced this perspective. But very often, this is a, a cultural image of solitude, of, of being somewhere within yourself, kind of to look for, for perhaps creative resources as well. Now, what happens when <clears throat> we move towards creativity and culture? So if you remember, this was the, the, the middle image in which there is an element of overlap. So obviously here creativity and culture are related to each other. Uh, creativity is seen again as quite an individual attribute and uh, interpreted mostly in psychological terms. But culture becomes something less external to the psychological. I mean this in a way, this is what I'm presenting on this slide, is kind of the common or the standard point uh, uh, in which we are today when we think about these two concepts. Creativity very much kind of psychological and cognitive in terms of types of thinking. I mean, the list is, is very wide. It's, it's mostly cognitive. Uh, there is quite little research on emotions and creativity, or there is some on motivation and creativity. But it's mostly about divergent thinking, um, uh, combinatorial thinking, lateral thinking, you name it. Um, and then culture, seen as, uh, seen as a set of values and norms that come to shape, to some extent, individual psychology. And that's the part of the overlap, right? But that also implies that there is some creative activity that is kept outside of culture in some ways. It's private and personal and unique. And then there is some that is made somehow public and that becomes kind of part of culture in some ways. Uh, it also supports a view that uh, everyone has creative potential. This is what I called, in contrast to the he paradigm, the I paradigm of creativity. And again, this is where we are uh, most of the times so when we think of creativity. We live in a day and age um, at this particular historical time, and perhaps even in this geographical cultural space, in which we embrace this idea that everyone has creative potential. Creativity is something that can be educated, um, and this is very much a democratization of creativity compared to the previous uh, view. But at the same time, it remains deeply individualistic in the way creativity still is grounded in the mind or the psychological attributes of the, the person. And I, I would even launch this accusation, although I myself am a psychologist, as, as uh, Magda mentioned, um, of psychologizing the topic. Of course, psychology has an enormous part to play and psychological processes are fundamental for creativity. But my argument today will be that creativity expands the psychological in some ways. Creativity is psychological, it's social and cultural and material at the same time. So this is creativity and culture. And uh, if I am to show a, a photo, I think my, one of my favorites is the one with the cubicles, the, the, the culture of, of work nowadays. Each person can have creative potential and it's encouraged to create but slightly separate from each other, right? I mean, you have your own workspace, you produce in your little corner, and research shows, uh, if, if uh, you know or if you remember, uh, that a lot of creative ideation happens around the, the water fountain or the coffee machine, right, where people come together more. But this idea of, of separation and segmentation is, it remains quite strong in that uh, view. And finally, this idea that creativity and culture overlap almost completely, that you can't think of creativity unless you do it in cultural terms, and at the same time that you can't conceive of culture unless you recognize its creative element, its, its capacity to, to transform and to renew itself. So creativity and culture here become interdependent, which is one of the big premises of uh, sociocultural psychology, which is a branch I, I, um, I'm trained in, uh, informed in. Uh, as I mentioned, creativity is much more than an, a psychological process now. I'm not going to, uh, actually for me, these are very permeable kind of boundaries. 
the psychological, the social, and the material, they're not kept separate from each other. Uh, if you know, I mean, some of you probably, of course, know about extended cognition, uh, cognition, distributed cognition, the extended mind hypothesis. So I'm very much kind of building on that type of literature to think of our psychology as fundamentally social, fundamentally kind of extended into the world. And there are so many works done about how, I mean, today our memory is distributed, right? We all have phones and tablets and whatever with calendars. So a lot of, of what we assume are purely psychological functions, they actually happen in between people or in between the person and the material support. So that's where the story of creativity comes in within this paradigm. Culture here is not seen anymore as just something external, objects and institutions and even norms, but something that is much more personal in many ways. Uh, I'm using here a very Vygotskyan kind of approach to culture to think of it as the set of signs and tools that mediate our existence, our action, uh, and the way in which minds extend, mind extends into the world with the help of these signs and tools. I'm going to come back to this particular uh, issue. So here, creativity uses culture to produce culture. This is, this is how actually we, buy, we bind the two together. And the way we look at creativity is through this much more collaborative perspective, which I called the we paradigm. And here, creativity is treated in terms of co-creation, distribution, and participation. So the focus, if, if you are kind of an applied researcher or a practitioner, and if you were to use the we paradigm, you would focus a bit less on individual attributes and how can I stimulate the, the, the creativity of this person. Because creativity being relational, it should orient you towards looking at context and trying to build cultures of creativity, right? So helping people participate in this bigger ecology of what it means to create. And um, just another image here would be all of these, I mean, we live in an age of, of hyper-connectivity and interconnectivity and distribution. And of course, we know the downsides of that. Actually, if I get to the end of the talk about society, I will address some of the, the issues there. But uh, our, our minds, our you know, ways to communicate uh, are, are enhanced. And in some ways, we would expect that creativity would be enhanced as well. But it doesn't always happen. It's not o only like that. It's not because we have access to all this information and resources that we actually use them or we use them creatively. So let's go back to culture. Um, as I started talking about it, probably you realize that I look at culture in, in slightly a different way than a lot of definitions nowadays that propose a, a bit of a laundry list or shopping list of elements, right? Uh, when we talk of culture, many people start listing different things that belong to culture, languages, uh, religion, tradition, institutions, the values and norms that I mentioned. But from a sociocultural point of view, actually culture goes much deeper than that. I'm gonna use the, the phrase of Michael Cole in his very important book, 996, which was introducing um, cultural psychology, that we are living like fish in the water of culture. We're not aware of it. Uh, we might become aware when we travel to distant lands and we experience culture shock, but we actually use culture. And, and I mean, we have to just look at this situation over here, the, 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 the common language that allows us to communicate, the way we are seated me here and you there, the way we have an understanding of what's happening in this lecture hall, this is all part of culture. So we do it at every moment. Culture constitutes the mind, it's not external to it, and it equips it with the resources needed, the content, it shapes these processes. There is a, a lot of cross-cultural psychological work and cross-cultural research in general, arguing more and more towards that. And um, at once it is constraining and freeing our creative expression. This is not a, an image of black and white, the idea that either a culture crushes creativity or it's, it's always fostering creativity. It's actually doing both at the same time. And this goes back to a, a bigger debate about the role of constraints and creativity, right? Uh, you would think constraints can be difficult, but there is no creativity outside of constraints. If I was to tell you draw something and I didn't give you any constraints, that, uh, constraint, there would be more blocking than if I gave you actually, I, I would scaffold in a way your activity. So there is an optimum to be reached here. But just to keep in mind this idea that there is a double relation there in some ways. So I was mentioning this idea of mediation. This, this goes back to Vygotsky. It goes back to, to much broader kind of scholarship and, and uh, philosophy as well. But the, the main idea about culture and the way I'm trying to connect creativity, culture, and imagination would be to say that what culture does most of all is that 
it, it makes us live in a mediated way in the way we experience the world. So there is a very direct way that is guided by our sensation, perception, and immediate action. And, uh, you know, a lot of animals perhaps experience this kind of, of, of universe. Uh, infants, when they are born, they live in the here and now, in the immediate. Uh, and we also go back to that when we touch something very hot and then we, we immediately take our hand, you know, unprocessed kind of experience. But most of the time, actually, because of these signs, the, the symbolic elements we use, the language we use, and the tools, you know, very concrete technological tools and pencils and paper and whatever you have in front of you right now, we actually are able to escape, not be trapped fully by the here and now, and to create a little bit of distance between ourselves and what is happening. And this distance is provided by culture. Culture gives us the means to be able to reflect, to plan, to decide, and, and ultimately, ultimately as well to, to create. So culture mediates our experience of the world, and I think I was mentioning to some students today in class how um, sociocultural psychologists love the triangle. It's not an esoteric symbol. We, we use it <laughs> to, to signal uh, mediation. And there are, many, there are many types of things that people put on this triangle. So here I'm proposing self-other object, but some people use self-other and sign, and, and, and there are many versions of it. But just to, to kind of simplify it, the idea of culture is that you need the person, obviously, this is not an anti-individual type of model, you need the person, but you also need the social relation, you need the other, and then you need the, the kind of the world, right, the, the material, the physical, the embodied reality that self and other uh, kind of relate to in some way. So why cultural mediation? The relation between self and other is mediated by all these objects, by tools, by signs, by language. At this very moment, I'm talking to you, so I'm using these cultural resources to mediate, right, to, to, to make this connection. At the same time, other people mediate the relation between self and object, because he had this beautiful um, sentence, or he had many beautiful sentences, but one of them says that the road from the child to the object goes through another person. And if you think about it, it's, it's all this idea that other people are instrumental in introducing us to this very cultural world. They present the objects, they teach us that this is a water bottle, right? So that we know later on. And the way we use it, we use objects and refer to them is very much through the perspective of other people. So the notion of mediation goes a long way. I'm just trying to exemplify that you can look at mediation looking at each angle of this triangle. And I'm gonna come back to this triangle uh, a bit later on in my talk. And uh, finally, I want to say one thing about, or a few things about imagination, because I'm gonna come back a little bit to it. I was very too ambitious, perhaps, trying to bring all these three big concepts together. But if culture uh, enables us to live, not only in the immediate, but also opens up these other spaces of the past, of the future, of the possible, this is what we usually call imagination. So imagination and culture, again, go hand in hand. And if you want my own uh, kind of uh, understanding of imagination, it really refers, it's, it's a sociocultural psychological process that helps us relate to absence, yes? To what is not present or not yet present in our lives. This is where imagination comes in. Um, for those who are interested, I'm, I'm happy to share, there is a, a kind of a growing literature from the sociocultural tradition. You notice that in, in purely cognitive terms, people are, are studying imagination, but very often it's just mental imagery, actually. It's called imagination, but it's just mental imagery, and it's about how, how you rotate it in the mind, and of course this work has its own conclusions, its own application. But here I'm trying to get a bit, kind of, uh, look at the broader picture. So for me, imagination is this process that helps us relate to absence, and, and as such, it's the basis of creativity. You would not be able to create if you weren't capable to see more in the situation than, than just what is there, right, in many ways. So, okay, this is the, the bigger kind of the introductory frame. How is creativity dealt with, at least in psychology, which is my discipline, and how can we infuse some of these notions and concerns in the way we think about creativity, right? If you look at the vocabulary of creativity, Rhodes wrote uh, this, uh, proposed this four P's framework in the 60s, I think. Uh, it's based on reviewing definitions of creativity, and you notice that people talk either about the person, the process, the product, or the press, and press stands for environment. He didn't find a better word starting with the letter P, 
But it's also a bit telling if you think about the way we started with the culture versus creativity, press, right? The environment is kind of coming from the outside and pressing somehow, you know, impacting, uh, squeezing a little bit the creator. Now, this framework has been guiding a lot of research and, and many colleagues use it today, and, and it's all right in its own terms. But I would say that it, it proposes a very disjointed view of creativity. People follow it and they say nowadays, oh, I'm, I'm doing studies of the creative process, but they don't relate it back to the person or the product. Or I'm studying the creative person and I'm not looking at the other factors, right? We know they're there, but we just don't look at them. So what I, I tried to do at, at some point some years ago was to think about the vocabulary we use and to propose um, a kind of rewriting, and I called it the five A's. You see, I, I fell into the trap of uh, words that start with a letter. I'm sure there are other words that are relevant. They don't, don't start with an A, but bear with me. I thought about rewriting this vocabulary in terms of actors, audiences, actions, artifacts, and affordances. So, Again, I, I can share actually even these slides with you. I, I can't go into a lot of detail here. I, I, I could stay on this slide for a much longer time, but think about how relational this vocabulary is. You can't study the creative actor without thinking who is the audience for this creativity. You can't study action without thinking what kind of affordances are being explored and exploited in the way I act. I'm gonna come back, hopefully, to the notion of affordance. Uh, and then the products of creativity are artifacts. They are products of culture. Even a, a young child, or especially a young child, you know, drawing in, in his or her little corner, that's not culture as in high culture, the culture presented in museums, but it is a cultural artifact for the microcosm of, of culture in which the child produces that drawing. For the parent and the teacher and the colleague and the child, it is an artifact. It is a, a product of culture. So, the... Um, the way I related this into a little spaceship kind of model, I, I started thinking about distributed creativity and uh, the fact that if you look at the whole ecology of, of creating, you cannot stop at the actor and the new artifacts and the action that relates, uh, relates the two, but you need to think in this more systemic way. You can already notice the, the self-other object kind of uh, mediation triangle happening there. But I started referring more and more to creativity as a form of action. And I use action and activity. Uh, I'm not really an activity theory uh, kind of scholar. Uh, I know a bit about it, but I use it more broadly, perhaps in a more pragmatist way, that creativity is a form of doing and making. It's not only thinking. And don't get me wrong, I have nothing against thinking, but thinking is also an action. Because he would call it an internalized action, just the way he talked about imagination as internalized play, right? Um, so action for me is more integrative in many ways. It coordinates the psychological dynamic and the more behavioral and cultural. Action can only be cultural because action has intentions and, and, and uh, goals and uses cultural means to happen. It's not behavior that you can study in an insect and, you know, it's, it's human action has this uh, cultural element to it. And then there, it's all immersed within a, a frame of material and sociocultural affordances being used. And if I go a step further, why do I call this distributed creativity? Because you have different lines of distribution emerging within this bigger picture. Uh, Hutchins, obviously very famous for his distributed cognition model, he identified these lines uh, before, uh, the material, social, and temporal lines of distribution. I think they, they reflect very well what I'm talking about here. So when you study creativity, think about how it's distributed socially in the sense of who are the actors, who are the audiences, how do they relate to each other, how audiences are themselves the first, how actors are themselves the first audiences for their own creativity in many ways, and how audiences are creative actors in their own right. So there is very much a, a temporal dynamic embedded there. These are not fixed positions. Then think about the material aspect, the new and the old coming together, the material and the symbolic, and also about the temporal dynamic. This is a triangle, and I know I come from Switzerland, so I'm not branding, but it can be more like a Toblerone, right? Because it's a triangle that extends somehow in time, and, and it creates this dynamic within it. Sadly, my skills allowed me only a, a 2D image of it. Good, I think I'm doing good with time, because now I'm taking you to my own version of sociocultural um, psychology of creativity. And this version starts with the notion of difference. This is my starting point. Now, if you think about what characterizes creativity most, in a way, what is the atom, the core of creativity, 
the, uh, you know, the, the essence of it, um, a lot of words can come to mind. They come from the definition of creativity. Creativity is about novelty, originality. I mean, I, I was mentioning a few of, of these things. And yes, it can be about all of that. But I would say that fundamentally, creativity is about difference, yeah? Creativity requires or grows out of differences. If, you, if we go back to, to this uh, expanded kind of spaceship, you notice that there are gaps or connections between these different elements. There is a difference between self and other that is very kind of productive for creativity. The fact that I know some stuff that perhaps you don't and you know stuff that I don't makes this kind of dialogue emergent and potentially creative, right? If you knew everything I know, then we wouldn't need to have this lecture and the other way around. I wouldn't need to, uh, you know, ask for your questions. One of my favorite philosophers and literary scholars, Bakhtin, talked about the fact that you cannot see the back of your own head, right? He was a very dialogical thinker. So there is always a surplus of the other. There is a surplus of knowledge of the audience upon yourself and upon your, your ideas, right? If you look at your ideas from another perspective, you enrich them. So this kind of difference between self and other is very much conducive for, to creativity. Then the difference between materials and, and symbols. We use words and, and to designate objects, but this is not a one-to-one -one connection. We use one word to designate, like if I say chair, you're going to think of different types of chair. And if I present you with a concrete chair, you can say chair, but you can be more poetic. You can, you can use different words to describe that chair. This is what Paul Ricoeur talked about in his beautiful study of metaphors and uh, um, the metaphorical kind of nature of our language. And that's again a gap that we cultivate creatively. Or, or we can use creatively. And finally, there is a temporal gap, right, between what happened in the past, where we are now, and how we imagine the future. A lot of creativity comes exactly from these tensions between our memories of what was, what's, and, and, and our anticipation of where things could go. So just to summarize, creativity and difference, yeah, they, they really, um, there is something very deep here, hopefully, uh, in the relation between the two. But at the same time, I want to say that for me, difference is obviously a necessary condition for creativity. If there was no difference, again, there would be no need to create, even in a world without differences. Uh, thank God we live in a world full of differences that we know. Um, but it's not a sufficient condition. And, uh, you know, if you work in groups, you will immediately, all of us at some point worked in groups, we will know that although there are so many differences we can tap into, sometimes groups fail or that the experience is not very conducive to creativity. So I'm not trying to present you a romantic view of, of difference will always lead to more creativity, but I'm trying to make you aware of the fact that difference will always play a part in your creative process. It's a matter of aligning the other factors or conditions to actually make creativity happen or emerge. So difference is the first notion. The second notion that I'm going to use is, uh, and I use a lot, is the notion of perspective. This goes back, again, to quite pragmatist philosophy. George Herbert Mead is a great inspiration for me. And uh, perspective, I, I really like this notion because it's a very relational type of notion. Perspectives effectively bridge differences, right? They relate a certain position in the world with what the perspective is about, the object of it. So, for instance, I can have a perspective on this bottle, and my perspective is that it's a bottle and I can use it to store liquid, right, and drink from it. But if I'm an artist, I can think, I don't know, that I can glue this to the ceiling and call it art. That is a very different perspective on the bottle, do you see? So perspectives relate us to the world. These are not just ideas. These are, as neo-median scholars like Jack Martin and Alex Gillespie said, action orientations. When you develop a perspective, you have the, the kind of the, the beginning or they find their expression in the way we can act in the world. So the fact that I look at it as a bottle and, and I look at it as a liquid container or as a container will restrict my action, will restrict what I can do with it. But if I realize on a windy day that I can actually support papers because it's, it can, you know, be a, a weight, that's going to be a new perspective that opens new action possibilities around my use of the bottle. So perspectives have something really intrinsically important for creativity. Uh, again, I'm not the, the first one saying this, I'm sure. I mean, you, you look around and you see other people talk about perspectives and having a new perspective and so on. But I, w I would like us to give a more kind of conceptual basis to, to this notion. And the way to do that is, again, to go back to Mead, who beautifully talked about the fact that we live in an intrinsically perspectival world that is made possible exactly by culture. The fact that we're not trapped in the immediate of perception of, of the qualities of the bottle, but allows us to take a bit of distance and see that this object can be related to in many different ways. 
there are many perspectives I can you know, place on or, or use to relate to this one bottle. And that goes uh, for everything in life. It's not only objects, the bottle or the piano, uh, but it's also more abstract notions like democracy, right? How many perspectives are there on a concept like democracy? So we live in intrinsically perspectival worlds, and it's actually quite interesting to see how, this is a much longer digression, but there are some, um, some kind of areas of culture that try to deny their existence as a perspective. For instance, science often does that by using truth as a way of saying this is the only way in which you can relate to that, because that is the objective truth. Or, or sometimes religion does that as well by using faith and, and uh, you know, kind of masking the fact that everything we do can have multiple perspectives around it and kind of restricting a bit sometimes our relation to, to, the, uh, uh, to the object. So uh, just to come back to, um, to the point, it is because we live in this very diverse sociocultural world in which we have so many positions available to us. We go in our, you know, in our developmental trajectory, we go from being children and students and uh, children uh, and, um, uh, uh, yeah, to, to employees and to parents and so on. So we, we always exchange different social positions, social roles, uh, but we also physically exchange roles. I'm now in this position where I'm, I'm giving a lecture, but many times, of course, I'm in the audience and you are actually talking to others, so you're in my position, the one I am in now. So the, the beautiful thing about the notion of positions is that they're multiple and they, are, uh, they can be potentially exchanged. And because we exchange positions, is, uh, because we do that, we become more flexible and creative with the world around us. Because when we exchange a position, we can develop a new perspective on reality coming from that position. Yeah, I hope it makes sense. I have a little drawing afterwards. Um, and here, imagination comes back because imagination, if, if uh, imagination is about absence and constructing, you know, new meaning out of the situation, imagination is basically this fundamental process that uh, enables us to make and to take perspectives, to take the perspectives of, of others, or to build new perspectives on the world. So. If we have an object, any kind of object, it can be this water bottle, it can be a problem that you have to solve, it can be yourself as a person, right? Let's, let's call all of these objects. There is always, and there will always be a multiplicity of perspectives from which that object can be understood, can be approached, can be acted upon. The one that is very thick is the dominant perspective. Because we live in a world of culture and intentions and intentionality, everything is meant to do something with, in a way. That is the dominant, the, the kind of conventional or hegemonic perspective. The dominant perspective on the water bottle is that it's a container for water or liquid, right? That is the dominant perspective. At the same time, it can be a paperweight and it can be a, an art object. And I don't know, you can worship it and turn it into a cult object, God knows, or wear it as a conversation piece around your neck. Anyway, so you see, there are so many perspectives, but often we are pulled towards the dominant perspective. And yet, we can change, we can shift. And the reason we can do that is because we belong to different groups and we move within our lives, within our very social lives, between different positions. We can look at the world through the perspective of other people. So this is very interesting about the notion of, of position, the fact that it's very much embodied and very much social. It's not really only our mind imagining stuff within itself, but it is our concrete experience of the world that helps us accumulate all of these resources to, to, to multiply the, the kind of positions we can take. So from this very simple kind of framework, creativity emerges as a process of basically dialogue, putting in relation different perspectives. If I think of this traditionally as a bottle, because it is a bottle, right, so I have this dominant perspective, what happens if I realize, no, you can use it as a paperweight? That opens the possibility that it can be many other things. And because I can use two different perspectives on the bottle, something new can emerge out of them. By putting them in relation, by reflecting on this difference between perspectives, is where a lot of creativity happens. Now, I'm not gonna claim that each and every act of creativity follows this model, but I would say that in many ways, this is the inner dynamic of, of creativity. Again, I would be very happy to have counter examples and, and think you know, more deeply about this. So, what have I been trying to say so far? Let's sum up a little bit, because I, I think I've been taking you on a very long journey. One is that culture enables the di diversification of positions, 
and the different perspectives associated with them. It is because we live in cultural worlds that we have all of these. We can be, you know, parents and children, teachers and, and students, and, and so many different positions we occupy because we live in, in worlds of culture. Uh, cons and, and this diversification and perspectives, it's, uh, they're, they're put in connection or, or kind of scaffolded um, they, by constructing, what am I doing here? Culture enables this di divers diversification because it, it uh, constructs different worlds and this is scaffolded by, by imagination because imagination is the process that builds these perspectives and puts them in dialogue. And this dialogue has emergent properties and it's expressed in what here I called creativity. So just to read it in, in one go because I, I think that's how I actually imagined it or I wrote it on the slide. Culture enables the diversification of positions and uh, um, associated perspectives by constructing diverse socio-material worlds and scaffolding our imagination. And imagination in turn constructs new perspectives, relates them to each other, which is a dialogue I call creativity. So this would be, if you read it kind of condensely, you will see kind of the, the steps of my argument. Now, let me take you to a very concrete example because I, I feel all of this can be a bit theoretical, but if we, if we think about a brick, this is a very common item in divergent thinking tests. I'm not personally using divergent thinking tests very often, but I do uh, sometimes when I, when I teach. So I, many of you will be familiar with the, the simple test of creativity, which is actually a divergent thinking test. How many things can you do with a brick, right? What can you do with a brick? Now, who would volunteer a potential use of the brick? What do we use bricks for? Yes. You can murder someone with the brick? Ah, you went just very far ahead. <laughs> but yes, you can do that. Uh, yes. You build the less violent one, you say you build a house with it. Ah, okay. So, <laughs> so building, right? Thank you for that. So the, the very kind of conventional perspective on the brick that comes easily to mind, right? Because culture kind of scaffolds or orients us towards it, is to say that we, we can build with bricks. And how do we know this? Well, we know this because we know this position in the world which is being a builder. We might not be ourselves builders or have builders in our family, but we've seen builders, you know, we see them in movies, we know we're taught that builders use the brick in that manner. So there is a position from which using bricks to build makes perfect sense. And this is, it's usually the conventional one. But we also know this because we ourselves have experiences of building as children, for instance, right? We build either with Lego or uh, any other type of material. So we know what building is like as a process. So you can see how this, this very uh, kind of conventional perspective has a history, even a personal history, in terms of our own ways of positioning ourselves to enact this perspective. Now, we had another, another use of, of the brick. Can someone volunteer more? I don't think I have murder in the slide, sadly, but uh, yes. <laughs> Again, oh my God, killing. <laughs> killing, yes, I don't have it on the slide, sadly. Yes, sorry. As a hammer. Well, let's say to break some things, right? <laughs> Maybe some of you were thinking about the window. Uh, so breaking a window, yeah, this is another, another perspective on the brick. Who has this perspective normally? Who does that kind of stuff? Thieves, yeah? For instance, teenagers or protesters, right? So you can see these different positions from which using the brick as something you know you break a glass with makes sense. This shows in many ways the, the, the fact that it is by repositioning, by being able to think from different positions that we get to become more flexible and get to achieve this divergent thinking in terms of what we can do with a brick or how we relate to, to objects. And Again, the, the, the core of the argument is that all of this helps us redefine creativity. I didn't offer you a definition of creativity because I kept it towards this middle part. Um, the standard definition used in the field is that creativity has, is a process that leads to, or, or it's defined as products that have these dual attributes. New, original, surprising on the one hand, and valuable, useful, fitting on the other. And as I mentioned before, the assumption is that the process is very much psychological, very much cognitive, and there are colleagues like Mark Runko who propose parsimonious models, meaning that we should try to eliminate the context and focus on what is truly specific for creativity, which is the psychological process. 
This is one way of defining creativity. What would my little kind of framework there with perspectives lead us to as a definition? Well, first of all, we would recognize creativity as a psychological, socio-material, and cultural process. And again, I'm not trying to separate these very strictly because I think they really kind of um, inform and infuse each other. Um, grounded in our capacity to imaginatively reposition ourselves, develop multiple positions and place them in dialogue in ways that lead to the emergence of meaningful novelty, evaluated as such by someone at some point in time and in a certain place. So I, I kind of deliberately broke down this definition because I think, well, it's a lot to take at once, but you see the idea that creativity goes beyond the mere, the pure psychological. It is about imaginatively developing, repositioning oneself and developing new perspectives and leads to the emergence of meaningful, uh, useful forms of novelty that are evaluated as such by different groups, by different people at a certain point in time. So basically what creativity does in many ways is that it both engages us with and cultivates the possible in our life and in our experience, both within and between individuals, individual minds, and within society as a whole. So this is where kind of my, my theoretical expose comes and ends. And, um, what I will propose is that very briefly, uh, so my, my big proposition, as you saw, is to try to place culture at the center when it comes to thinking about creativity and redefining it, and to use culture in order to, to conceive of or redefine the relation between imagination and creativity through these notions that I've been discussing briefly, position, perspective, dialogue, reflexivity. Um, and I will try to apply this view to three different areas. I, I don't have a lot of time, but I'll try to be quick. One of them is, is human development, early development, yeah? Now, um, I'm, I'm venturing into a very big area, but just to give you a, like the, the, the shortest version of this story, a lot of developmental psychology and developmental kind of scholarship talks about early development as this slow uh, and, and oftentimes painful, uh, at least if you're in, working in a psychoanalytical tradition, process of realizing that there is a difference between self and other, between baby and, and uh, caregiver, right? And a lot of process of development actually is about how do we navigate that difference? If you look at old, but, but still obviously very big developmental theories like Freud, Piaget, Vygotsky, Winnicott, all of them, one way or another, talked about the self-other difference and how it, it fits into human development. Piaget famously talked about decentration, right? And in many ways, what I've been saying about the capacity to not have only a very personal, direct perspective on, on the object, but have multiple perspectives, which very often are the perspectives of other people, is actually what Piaget, I, I think, it's the essence of, of his notion of decentration. The fact that we live in complex cultural worlds in which each person has a different perspective and we get to slowly understand their perspective and decenter from our own position and our own unique perspective on things. Um, again, very briefly, Winnicott is a scholar that inspired a lot uh, some of my early thinking. He, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with his work. He was a, kind of a psychoanalyst. Um, he wrote a, a wonderful book about play and reality. And um, he talked about this difference or this differentiation in human development between the me world and the not me world. Again, the gap I was talking about, right? Self and other. And the child gets to understand and deal with this separation, yet strives for union, for, for regaining this kind of feeling of union with the caretaker. And this union for Winnicott is recovered symbolically when the child starts using transitional objects. So these are, for instance, the little blanket that, that comes to stand in for the mother or the caregiver in general and, and reconstructs this union or this safety that the, the child feels. And basically, uh, and the reason I'm, I'm putting Winnicott here is to show that for him, this is the, the first use of, of imagination in many ways. The fact that we build these transitional, temporary objects and symbols that help us bridge the gap, the difference between self and other. So the story of, of using imagination in very early human development relates a lot to culture and to the separation between self and other. But something else goes even further, and, and this is where we often think about the developmental history of creativity and imagination as starting in pretend play. I'm not gonna go uh, read all the, the quote by, by Gardner. Obviously, he um, and many others talked a lot about pretend play, 
He talks about how the child uh, around the age of two, and obviously with the help of language and culture, right, using signs and tools, uh, enters this realm of symbolic activity. The fact that the child is able to look at an object from multiple perspectives. This is the bottle, but at the same time it can be a submarine, right? These are two different perspectives that the child can coordinate. The child never forgets that this is also a bottle, or this is primarily a bottle, but can use a different perspective as well on the object. And that's how pretend play is born. Vygotsky talked about the relation between the field of perception, I see it's a bottle, and the field of meaning. So it's a, there are many ways to deal uh, or to, to think about that. And all of them, Gardner, Winnicott as well, talked about these very early imaginative acts within pretend play and saw them as the origin of later on great uh, leaps of imagination. So uh, play later on leads to literary activity, to science, to art, all of these big human achievements have their origin within these very minute kind of developmental acts. So pretend play, if we look at it, um, Gardner's work obviously points to this interplay between culture and imagination in early development and pretend play, uh, which is in many ways the developmental origin of creativity as I mentioned, is at once cultural because it, it makes use of these symbols of culture and these different perspectives and very much imaginative in the way it puts these perspectives together. In play, what children do is get to experience and also experiment with different positions and different perspectives. This is a lot what children's games and play is about in many ways, right? And I, I have to mention here again Vygotsky had this beautiful metaphor that when doing that, when engaging in pretend play, the child is a head taller than himself or herself. I find it it really, it's really beautiful because it shows this developmental, huge developmental capacity or potential of episodes of play. And what children play is basically they play society, right? They play different positions in the world and they try to relate or understand the, what does it mean to be a doctor? What does it mean to be, not all children are privileged enough to have all of these affordances and toys and all, but this is the essence of play. It exposes them to different positions. They get to change them and, and develop new perspectives on what it is to be human in many ways. So what happens in play? Children get to embody, at first physically, because you see they dress up as a doctor or as a, as a nurse or whatever, a policeman, different positions, and then they develop that perspective. What, what do doctors do? What do parents do, obviously? And they play that perspective out. Um, I say initially physically because, as Vygotsky said, we internalize this process and nowadays if I'm to think what would my doctor say if I told uh, him or her that I ate five donuts, I don't have to put uh, a coat on to think like a doctor. I can do that imaginatively, right? I can reposition myself within the imagination. So if you think about very simple games like hide and seek, there are two positions there and this is something Alex Gillespie and uh, Jack Martin talked extensively about. Um, the hider, the one who hides, and the one who seeks. And you have to understand the perspective. What does it mean to be a hider? What does a hider do? And what does a seeker do? And to move between them, to coordinate them. It's very interesting to see children at a very, very early on when they, they try to grapple with the meaning of hide and seek and the, the errors they do. They hide, but they don't hide their bodies fully. Or they seek, but they don't, they don't cover their eyes, right? Because they don't fully get what is the position they have and what is the perspective they should enact. It is by moving between, repeatedly, you know, being a hider, being a seeker, and so on, that they get to understand the game and actually excel at the game. This is a very simple game, but it has a crucial developmental kind of lesson to it. Because think about it, to be a good hider, you have to imagine where a seeker would look for you. So you have to do all of this mental repositioning, right? The, the kind of thing that I've been talking about. So this is how they develop new perspectives in games and how they integrate them. And this is very much, in a nutshell, almost like the, the, the cultural story or the, the developmental story of how culture, imagination, and creativity come together. I'm going to, because I'm, I'm really, I should stop at some point, I'm going to talk a little bit about the experience of wonder. This is a field of, of study that I, I'm entering at the moment. There is very little written on wonder, and I feel there is a great potential between what I said about engaging with the possible and creativity and the way we, we experience wonder. So let's take one example, and I'm still thinking mostly about children. Oh, you have a plate, right, as, as an object. Uh, this is a toy plate. So it can also be a plate that adults eat on. It doesn't have to be a toy plate, but this was supposed to be a toy plate. The child gets to acquire this position as, as someone who uses plates, you know, uh, in, in the kitchen or elsewhere. And the perspective on, on this is that you use them to 
eat from, from them, right? You have cutlery on and you start eating. And this is what toy makers and parents encourage children to, to do with plates. So they, they really foster children's acquisition of that perspective, that particular perspective. But obviously, in games, they get to understand play, uh, the plate, the simple plate, differently. This whole example was inspired by, by a little episode I saw. There is research done by other colleagues, Christian Moreau and others in Lausanne, of uh, child-parent interactions. And in a game between child and parents, in, a, in an episode of play, um, the child at some point put the plate on the head, right? And it kind of smiled at the mother and, and realized that he's determining in many ways the meaning of what a plate is. He proposed it as a hat. What do you think the mother did? Well, in that episode, she took off the plate from the head and started pointing to eating, right? Because she, she really wanted to enforce the dominant perspective. But nonetheless, that child and many other children get to understand that plates themselves are not fixed. You know, you can look at them from multiple positions. They can be hats as well. And the moment that happens, you enter this state in which you think, okay, if a plate is for eating, but it can also be a hat, what else can a plate be? And here I've, I'm just giving one random example I Google for, right, uses of a plate. Well, you, you can create new things like a fan and a watermelon at the same time. But basically, if I go back to, to my idea about perspectives, the experience of wonder is the experience of being put in this meta position in which you have two or more perspectives on one object and you start thinking, what else can this object be? What other perspective, what other possibility is there? I wrote a very short paper on this, and if you're interested, I'm, I'm very happy to, to distribute it. So to sum up the developmental argument, pretend play is a key driver of development. Uh, it is made possible by culture through toys, symbols, and interacting with others. It supports and is supported in turn by the imagination. Uh, children engage in a lot of as-if thinking and what-if within experiences of wondering. And uh, it is at the root of creative processes later on in art, science, and everyday life. I'm going to go very briefly, I think, over everyday life because I, I want to get to the last part and I want to have a, a bit of time for questions. But um, basically what I wanted to say in this section of the presentation is that you, you don't have to think all, only about these heights of human achievement like the arts and sciences to see the dynamic between perspectives and how they shape our creative action. Arguably, Darwin had to develop a new perspective on finches, those poor little dead birds that had different sizes and forms and shapes when they're from the continent or from Galapagos and so on. He had to, to, to kind of understand or develop a new perspective which became a theory of evolution. Art also plays with perspective. What did Duchamp do by signing a urinal? He basically took a very conventional object and put a completely new perspective on it. But this dynamic also transforms our everyday life. And I'm gonna propose, I mean, very, very quickly, I'm gonna go through craft. Um, some of you know here that my doctoral study actually has been about uh, Easter egg decoration in Romania, which is completely out there. Um, but it was my attempt to kind of understand creativity from a community perspective and the relation between creativity and tradition and habits and, uh, and, um, and kind of go away from this creativity as a very psychological process. It's a very embodied type of craft. If you're wondering what is creative about craft, and, and Easter egg decoration, you can just look at these three eggs that were made by the same person, not for me, but they just existed there, so I pulled them together. This is kind of the same motif, but it's never the same motif fully. I mean, if you look at the way the band is, down, is, is done down, or even at the details, and there are three different procedures of making this, you will realize that the essence of creativity in very everyday life type of activities like craft is always combining and recombining and, and kind of adding in a new perspective on things. Um, here I remember one quote from the interview. The person said, uh, because you know, a common accusation against, against craft is that you're very repetitive and you always do the same thing and reproducing all the time. And the person said, it's easier for me to change something than to create the same egg twice. And think about that. That is the way we work usually. It's much easier to improvise than just stick with, with the, the same form. So I'm gonna, very briefly, I was gonna tell you about how craft is at this intersection between the intentions of people, what they want to do, the material support they work with, and the normativity of a, of a cultural environment, and kind of relate this a little bit to the notions that I've been using. This again comes from another strand of my work, but if you think about it, when we engage with craft or any other everyday life activity, we have a certain perspective, so a certain intention of what what we want to do and how we want to use certain things. 
We use certain affordances, so we look at what does the object afford our action. Does it allow me to you know, put liquid in? Obviously, this does, so it has that affordance. And the conventions around that. Putting liquid is okay, but what if I put, I don't know, ice cream in a bottle? It's a bit less conventional, right? So a lot of our, a lot of our everyday life happens exactly at this intersection between our perspective matches a certain affordance and, uh, com um, and um, kind of follows the conventional. And this is what we usually do. We use chairs to sit on, right? The perspective is that chairs are for sitting. Chairs have exactly the affordances to have one, someone sit on them, and it's very conventional and expected of you to sit on chairs. So that's how we use them most of the time. And a lot of creativity actually comes from exploring these other spaces where we miss one of these elements. So, for instance, we don't fully have the perspective, but if we had it, the affordances allow us to do that. Conventionally, we could do that. And if we only develop the intention or this new look, we could do it. Um, better to give you actually some concrete examples from Easter eggs. So here is one example where a new affordance is discovered. People have this perspective that eggs are to be decorated. You, you decorate them with wax, uh, and you usually erase the wax from the egg. And then what people do here is that they leave the wax on the egg, and they start coloring the wax, which is a completely new, um, new procedure. So what they effectively do is that they use a new affordance of the wax. Instead of just taking it off at the end, they keep it on the egg. And once they do that, they develop a new perspective. Okay, eggs are really about geometry. You see a lot of them have geometric motifs, especially in northern Romania. But then people start drawing on them. So now that I have all of these affordances, I can use wax, I can use multiple colors, why don't I draw on them? So you develop a new perspective there. You can uh, do figurative stuff. And then you start challenging the conventional as well. So this is a Christmas egg made by one of the, the participants I had in my study. This is extremely unconventional in Romania, yeah? So this person is really pushing the boundaries of, of uh, that model in the convention direction. But it's very common in places like Denmark. I don't know how it is in the US, but in Denmark, actually, you have Christmas eggs, uh, as I remember. You can hang, hang in trees as well. So the craft argument is that Craft activities are individual, social, cultural, material, symbolic at the same time. And everyday creativity, what it does is expand the boundaries of what's possible by engaging at once different perspectives with affordances and conventions. And there is a much bigger argument, I won't get into details now, but craft is not only creative or potentially creative, but creativity in many different other domains, from art, to design, to science, has these kind of craft-like properties. Um, you always go through apprenticeships, you always use different affordances, you respect different conventions, and so on. But where I want to take you in, in three minutes or less is uh, the notion of society, because what I started with the we paradigm, and if you remember my discussion of culture, in many ways what I'm trying to do is to place society at the heart of creativity. It is by internalizing, experiencing, appropriating these various positions and perspectives in the social world that we become creative as people and, and we can express ourselves creatively. Um, but there is also another way to look at this connection. So instead of putting society within creativity, how about we try to put creativity back into society? And how would it be to think of society itself as a domain um, of creativity? And if you think about it, creativity has a lot to do not only with kind of radical social change and the way in which you transform society, you would probably immediately think of that, but also with maintaining human relations on a very daily basis, mundane kind of uh, human interaction. Simmel, the, the big sociologist, um, talked about sociability as the way in which we use improvisation and creativity to keep connections between people going. Think about how you relate to others. You know, you always put in a little joke. You always try to, to kind of test a little bit the, the relationship. And, and we don't relate to others in a very mechanistic way. That's what Simmel would call sociability. So, what, what would be the place of creativity within society? Well, I'm going to take the classical example. I'm not talking about uh, sociability, but I'm talking about social change. There is obviously a big contribution of creativity. If you look at protests and social movements, thank God we have a lot of these nowadays. Well, thank God and, and not really, but, uh, but there is really like a volcano, volcano of, of creativity and, and um, a buzz of activity happening in that area. And yet, if you look at the literature on creativity, people rarely use the word to theorize what's happening in protest and in social movements. 
And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that creativity has been very much seen as an individual property, as something that happens in the mind, so people don't connect it back to society. But now we have a framework, like this one with perspectives and, and so on, that actually could allow people to make that connection back and to socialize creativity. The example of artivism, yeah? This is Banksy's uh, The Walled Off Hotel, which is overlooking the Bethlehem Wall. And of course, I'm, I'm, I think you're familiar with the street artist Banksy. He made this hotel in which inside, actually when I made the slides, I thought you might think that guy is me, it's not me, it's another person. He, uh, he, he took these classical motifs or motifs of a hotel and he applied a new perspective on them. So you have, you expect in hotels to have sculptures, but what about reminding people of the conflict that is happening right there, you know, a step away? So this sculpture has a, a gas mask on it. Or your hotel room would have something like that. A pillow fight, a serious conflict, you know, two different perspectives that create tension, reflexivity. So I think you can already see where I'm going with this. The way in which artivism works and a lot of protests and social movements work with art is basically they tap into this perspectival model. What art tries to do is to demonstrate imaginatively new ways of seeing the world and, um, and our everyday life, to restructure our understanding of it. I'm gonna give just one very quick example. Uh, this is a movement that took place in Serbia, I think, the Otpor movement, where I find it very interesting because in a situation of protest, what uh, students or protesters were doing, they used mirrors to show the policemen, to show themselves, you know, the policemen to themselves, and that, that was their way of protesting. Where there was a barricade of policemen, they held mirrors in front of them. I find it very powerful because it, it exactly shows, in many ways, what we talked about perspective. What they used to protest was basically developing or trying to stimulate a new perspective in the policemen to show themselves to them so that they could see themselves as the protester saw them. Imagine how powerful this is as a mechanism stimulating kind of human understanding and mutual understanding. Look how I see you in this situation. You know, this is how you appear. So I'm not going to say all social movements do this, but I think a lot of them actually are meant to put us in this situation of imaginative kind of wondering, the meta position I've been mentioning in, in, about wondering. What protest, or at least very successful or creative protest does, is to take one perspective and add multiple others to our understanding so that it kind of creates this space of dialogue between perspectives where new meanings can emerge. I had a, a big part here that I'm gonna skip. It's the idea that all of these protests, although they're wonderful and very creative, they often fail. And why do they fail? One idea is that because they diversify perspectives a lot, but they don't have necessarily one version or view of reality that they want to impose. So then they fade away gradually. So there is a, a huge benefit in being creative and diversifying perspectives, but there is also a benefit in converging and also knowing what you want to accomplish with, with the, the protest, right? At the same time, we should not think uh, of, of the success of protests only in terms of, of their short-term success. Did they, did they achieve to topple a regime or not? Did they create change or not? In many ways, their, their long-term kind of developmental impact is really the one that matters the most. Because by developing these new perspectives on reality, they expand for us the, the space of the thinkable, of what becomes possible in the situation. And because we can think it, we can possibly potentially also do it. So the space of the doable is also expanded. So this is how in many ways creativity and imagination feed back to society and to the culture of protest of today by looking at, at issues of empowerment. Okay, so I, I mentioned this, the, the last slide is about ethics because I think each one of the positions I mentioned at, at first has an ethical implication. If you look at creativity versus culture, you think that only special people can create and creativity is not for everyone. If you adopt a position of creativity and culture, then everyone can be creative, but creativity remains very much a personal attribute and thus a personal responsibility. If I'm not creative, it's because of me, right? Because I am the center of, of creativity. If you look at creativity as culture, then we create with and for others and therefore we share the responsibility of opening up spaces in which people can participate and can be creative also together in many ways. So the last point about ethics is that if creativity emerges out of difference and dialogue, then the implication is that diversity should be celebrated. Diversity becomes an engine of creativity and it should not be celebrated only at the declarative level. At the same time, all of these perspectives and positions, they don't exist in a level playing field. 
there are so many power relations that shape the, 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 the way in which a new perspective can be proposed. And very often what happens in these situations is that differences of perspective are ignored, denied, and even worse, they become something that people fear. This is a, an image from Europe, from my, my side of the Atlantic, and, and you probably know about the, the migrant crisis. Very often you have these images of boats, of anonymous people coming in. They're very rarely individualized. You don't see their faces. And there is a lot of rhetoric in terms of invasion, and well, at least with some parts of the media and some parts of society, invasion and contamination and so on. This is the, the typical perspective that some people put on migrants. What would it mean to actually think of migrants as coming with new sets of resources as well, new sets of positions. What, do we, what would it mean for our creativity, not, not only as individuals but as societies, to try to engage with that kind of difference and see what can come out of it? So the last, I promise, very last slide is about creativity and imagination um, as being, of course, as I mentioned, impossible outside of culture, but yet to gain most out of both these phenomena that are very human, we need to have this fundamental openness towards difference. Um, culture provides us with many perspectives. Some of them are dominant, hegemonic, but many of them are marginal. They're alternative or resistant. And a lot of the power, because I mentioned the power of imagination and creativity, rests actually in engaging precisely with these alternative or marginal perspectives. And this is often much harder uh, to do and, and very easy to say. But that is my message today. And thank you very much for your patience. <laughs>
Yeah, I, 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 think, I think what you're saying about the role of culture fits very well also within the, the, that, that, that kind of context of creativity and the different affordances people use to create, which again, they're very much culturally bound. Um, but yeah, it would be an interesting thing to think further about differentiating it in terms of more individualistic and collectivistic cultures, perhaps. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm a clinical psychologist and I sometimes give assessments in my practice yes. um, to measure intelligence. And so I wondered what you thought about um, a measure like the WACE, which sometimes, you know, we would give higher points to someone for yeah. answering kind of a loaded cultural question yeah, sometimes. Yeah in the normative um, way. <laughs> we're still on camera, right? Um, <laughs> so I, I'm, a, I'm a peculiar type of psychologist. That sociocultural psychology is very close to critical psychology as well. And it, it's nice to be critical, but you also need to construct something in place, right? So I, I think I mentioned it today to, to some of the students. In my own work, um, the, I never ask how, um, how, how much, um, how cre uh, creative is this? how much creativity there is in an object, but I'm thinking, how is that object creative and for whom? So what I, what I tend to do is have a more qualitative approach to, to kind of measurement. But I would say that for me, it's very useful to apply a certain tool if you do two things. One of them is to refer to what you're actually measuring in terms specific to that measurement. So a lot of people use divergent thinking, but they call it creativity. Divergent thinking is not creativity. It's a component. It can, you know, there are many studies about that. But then don't use a bigger word if you're actually asking. So be as concrete as possible when you explain to people what you're measuring. And the second, as you, you yourself said, look if it makes cultural sense to use that kind of understanding. I mean, if I went to the Easter egg decoration people and I presented to them, you know, these kind of top level models of creativity, the investment model and all of these things about genius, it would be completely disconnected from their practice. So I had to kind of build from the bottom up an understanding of habitual creativity and completely change the perspective. So I feel like it would be a, a great value if people could not only adapt a tool, but also kind of recreate the tool within a more local context. It's, it's a very complex thing to do, and I, I think it's not easy, but uh, I think if, if people understand that tool and measurement as one perspective and try to triangulate it with other perspectives, it's a, it's a huge step forward in any case. Thank you. So uh, in your uh, discussion of uh, creativity and uh, culture, uh, you, uh, you mentioned emergence a couple of times, and I was wondering uh, if you... Uh, you could, uh, I guess, elaborate on whether you think creativity is an, an emergent property of culture or if it is the way that things emerge from culture. Mm. Ah. Well, I, I guess here it's a matter of where you locate agency in many ways. Is it the agency of individuals or some people operate with uh, object agency and kind of the agency of culture making things happen? I feel like... Um, I, f I feel like culture is an enabler of, of all of this creative production. And also creativity is the rule of living in a cultural universe in the sense that you can't have a tradition like Easter eggs. It's never fully a tradition. It's always a neo tradition. Everything we imagine as stuck in time and traditional, it, it continues because it changes in many ways. So I, I feel like I understand the two perspectives you're mentioning here. Creativity can be the ever present quality of living in a cultural environment. And I feel like the pragmatists were trying to do that, John Dewey and uh, Joas, when he talked about the creativity of human action, but also that you can use culture and becomes a tool to actually accelerate or guide that, that process that is always there because differences are always there. Differences between self and other and time and object and symbols. So they, they, they are a space of emergence, the fact that this condition is set into place. So I guess that perhaps I would talk maybe about even a continuum between, you know, when, when emergence happens and creativity happens naturally in a cultural environment in some form, and then when it's kind of guided and, and, and it becomes part of this 5A system where actors and audiences actively change culture in some way. I don't know if I fully kind of got to the question, but that, that's what it made me think. Do, do you have any kind of follow-up or? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, one more. Um, so it seems that, you know, like young kids, uh, they are really much engaged in um, imaginary play. Yeah. 
and then it seems that kindergarten they come back home with a lot of projects yes which is, artifacts exactly yes <laughs> um, and then it seems that from first or second grade all of a sudden there are almost no projects at all yeah. because they're unfortunately uh, most educa educators are focused on you know the star exams or whatever it is um, just meet the standards yes. and, and it seems that they the kids are kind of lose their um, their imagina imagination or creativity or we as educators or parents mm. um, basically depress this uh, unfortunately and do you think that there is going to be a change you know do you think it seems that here yeah. I come from a different country so it seems that there is a way there is we are so focused on getting them ready for the exam yes. that we forget about how to encourage creativity how to encourage thinking outside the box how to there is some work on um, working in a group yeah. and, and helping each other kind of in terms of creativity and, and thinking of something from different angles but it seems that I know that my kids all they do all day is study for the exam it just it, it seems that we lost uh, in a way we lost creativity or we lost the, um, we, we can't encourage them anymore because they're they're so busy studying for their star or, yeah. or well, so in, what do you think about where are we going this is my question uh, where, where are, we, are going we going and That's what's going to happen in the future question but I do I do and have one, sorry and I have one more last question is as you you have the European experience and um, someone who is an educator here in the US as well do you think that the European culture encourages more creativity than the American culture? Uh, no? It's a very, very difficult question uh, because you, you already noticed that I, I don't diagnose creativity. I tend to think more what types of creativity are encouraged rather than, because there is no overall of creativity, right? And creativity can mean many things. For some people, it's about uh, expression and there's kind of an art-like process. For others, it's about problem solving. A lot of educational systems can be very successful encouraging a more problem solving apply type of creativity others are more about you know opening and and perhaps that's where our cultural interpretation of what creativity is come, comes into play and we often say schools kill creativity I'm gonna have a kind of a provocative argument but perhaps they 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 kill a certain way of expressing creativity if, if we go back to the idea that creativity is always present within the cultural system what what schools might be doing and I'm not defending all schools and all, all educational practices but they might kind of reduce the expressivity to be able to equip children with something else perhaps insight or other things that could be useful for creative expression in another way but also, if we go back to the perspective, I think what you said uh, kind of stimulated me to think, uh, again, in terms of perspectives. We often uh, equip children with this idea that they need to get the right perspective, because if they have the right perspective, they're going to be rewarded, they're going to do well. So I, I guess the first step is to make both children and educators aware that there is a multiplicity of positions and perspectives in the situation. And more than that, that there is value in exploring that, because we might be aware. I mean, it's not, uh, you know, uh, something so esoteric, but we don't see the value in doing that. So I think that that's the space of dialogue we perhaps need to have with educators. How do we, I mean, it's openness to difference, as I said in the, in the last slide. It's a very difficult process. You have to be sensitive to difference, you have to value the difference, and you have to act upon the difference to do something with it. These are the three steps, uh, and not all educational systems go up to the, the level there, the third one. But thank you. I, I, I wouldn't comment more on the difference between the American and European system because what is the European system? You know, so many countries, I, I grew up in Romania, I studied in the UK, I, I teach in, uh, in Switzerland, and they're all slightly different, but I do have this concern about the monocultivation of the mind in some ways, the fact that we, we always direct people towards one perspective. I think that's across the board, sadly. Uh, uh, we're, I think, about out of time for questions, so please join me in thanking uh, our speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have books for sale, and, uh, and that will be signing. Uh, and I, I, also, if you want to uh, chat for just a moment with Vlad about this talk, um, you have a question that you need to ask. I'm sure if you came by the table, you'd be happy to answer that. Even if you don't like it.
And do use that email in case you have further curiosity. I would love to say that. Thank you again. Thank you. This is our last uh, lecture for the season. We'll be back again next year. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and uh, have a great night.